Visualization, embracing the movie screen of the mind. So this is a very important topic uh, for us to consider when thinking about reading comprehension. Um, not only because uh, our culture is increasingly a visual culture uh, in which communication is presented in visual ways and visual representation has a high currency, but also because of the increasing use of digital media to communicate. Um, if we think of how Facebook and the Facebook feed has become a huge forum for sharing video files. We see now that video is definitely a, is a, is an important form of communication, not only to share, but also people are creating video texts quite easily. So it's, um, visual texts are much more in circulation. So something for us to consider definitely when thinking about supporting comprehension. While schools definitely tend to be more, um, print centric and not have as many visual texts, it's, it's helpful for us to think about how we can build on our visual culture and the strengths that our students have with visual culture to help support them in the more um, print-based forms of reading and making meaning. So this lecture isn't going to be so much about visual literacy, um, but more so about how we can tap into the powers of visualization to aid and strengthen learning. So they definitely overlap in ways, but this isn't necessarily going to be a definition of what visual literacy is. It's really about visualization as a tool, a support system that we can use. So what is visualization in terms of learning? Well, if we think about visualization for learning, we can think about it in two ways. We can think about it as internal and ex external. So we have internal visualization, and this was discussed quite a bit in the reading for this week, but internal visualization being um, that which is happening in our mind as we read through a text, as we um, look at an, um, a landscape, etc. What are the different images um, or visual stimuli that pop up in our mind. This is thinking about that. So when we hear the word butterfly, what is the first thing that you think of? When you hear the word mariposa, what do you think of? So depending on your language, depending on your prayer knowledge, etc., these words will trigger different visual imageries internally. So keeping in mind that there is much visualization happening inside our students' minds as we are teaching is a key component too to think about. Also, there is external visualization, so the process of actually creating nonverbal representations or um, forming uh, different visualizations. This could be in the form of drawing, it could be in the form of actually creating images, um, it could be in a variety of different ways in which you visually create, uh, some, uh, represent something nonverbally. So both of these two types of visualization work together um, and can become come at can be used to support comprehension. So how does all of this visualization help understanding? So much of the visualization and learning is based on dual coding theory. And so this was talked about briefly in um, your reading for this week, and I will just go over it um, very briefly here as well, but there's much more information on this if you, um, if your interest is piqued from hearing this and want to go deeper into thinking about how this dual coding can be a, a, a significant part of your teaching. But basically, dual coding theory is presenting the idea that verbal and nonverbal information are processed in separate but interconnected systems of the brain. And so each of these systems of representation, um, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, are coded in different ways in the working memory. And so basically your, your brain works differently to code these different um, symbol systems. So the ability then to code information in multiple code systems actually increases your chance, chances of remembering that info and that information. So if we think of, if we think of the word dog that we might see on the page of a book, if you have an image in your mind of a dog already established, that will help you make meaning of the word dog. However, if you don't have an image in your mind of a dog, it might, um, your ability to make meaning with use of that word might be less. However, also, um, to make an auditory connection, if you hear, if you hear the, the chain or the, the, the leash or the jingle of a collar on a dog, 
right away, depending on what your previous experiences are and your prior knowledge may be, you might instantly think of the word dog. You might actually see the word dog in your, in your mind and you might see an image of dog. So different stimuli um, are definitely interconnected and amplify our understanding, but they are coded differently. And so if your brain has to code things in multiple ways, your chances of remembering are better, as well as you, your ability to have more complex understandings of things in a more sophisticated schema related to that topic. So the idea of dual code coding theory is definitely intensified when we consider um, multimodal texts and multimedia texts, which are definitely multimodal. And what I mean by multimodal is they, they have multiple modes of expression in them, image, gesture, music, written language, spoken language, etc. All of those symbol systems or those sign systems are happening all at once. And so there's definitely um, dual coding happening when we are taking in a multimodal multimedia text. So when we actually are doing some of this multimodal composing or transferring um, our understanding of something from one mode to another, that is the process of transmediation. So that's when we are translating perhaps a verbal understanding of a text to a visual understanding of a text. And so when I can when I think of the most commonly um, understood, understood transmediations, we can think of a, of a movie adaptation of a book. So there you are taking a very verbal print-based text and you are translating it to a very um, visually rich, movement rich, auditory rich text. And so in actually creating, in actually, if you were the director of a movie, I mean, you, you would have um, the process of transmediation, of translating that book onto the screen with its many different um, multimodal levels would bring you a very complex and intimate understanding of that text. And so that is one of the reasons to consider having your students actually create images, actually do some visualization related to some of the texts that you're working with, because by going through the process of transmediation, it's actually intensifying their understanding, deepening their knowledge of those concepts of what they're doing, their visualization. And that's why we are, in fact, going to have are closing our semester with a visualization project in which you are visually representing uh, some concept within your inquiry blog topic. So we are actually going to be doing some of this transmediation, this translation of, of ideas. So now, how does all of this relate to reading? Well, visualization then is a very, um, a very important strategy for proficient readers. So basically, um, strong readers create mental images with ease when they are reading. So as they are reading through a book, um, not only do they understand what the words are saying, what the words are saying, but they have a knowledge such that there are many images running across the uh, movie screen of their mind which is helping them to make under, helping them to have um, more sophisticated understandings of the ideas. So if you don't, um, if the more prior knowledge you have about the topic, more than likely the more internal images you have. On the other hand, um, if students don't have a lot of prior knowledge about the topic that they are reading, then they are going to, their access to internal images is also going to be very limited and thus their comprehension will be limited. So using images and using visualization as a pre-reading strategy or during reading strategy can really activate prior knowledge and build up that prior knowledge. And then also using visualization after reading can be a way to definitely, um, through that translation, can be a way to have um, the students, the readers, build knowledge so that going further they have more internal images um, that they can access. And this is important to think about, especially if you're working with um, students that are learning a second language or learning world languages. Visualization is a very um, significant part of um, reading support and vocabulary learning support when learning languages. So we um, also read over a variety of different visualization techniques. So that's what visualization is and how it can support learning and reading and then for our reading this week, we read some about that and we read over all of these different activities that can be used um, that, that draw on visualization to support, to support um, comprehension, both internal visualization and external visualization. Something that was not mentioned in the 
in the reading, but is still very important, and I wanted to point it out here, is the use of doodling. And so doodling or drawing visual notes of some visual note taking of some sort is actually a visualization strategy that I think all teachers should embrace more. Rather than seeing doodling as a sign of disrespect or the students not being focused, it actually can very much be um, active processing of information that's happening for the student. Even if they're not necessarily drawing a direct representation of what you're saying, it still can be a way to help them process and stay focused on the content. And so in this short uh, TED Talk, you can watch this if you'd like. It's, um, it's linked at the end of the lecture, but it, um, <coughs> or right here. But it just talks about the many ways that doodling is actually, we should re-see doodling and how we can see doodling as a strategy um, for problem solving in general. But I would like us to also think about how we might encourage doodling as a form of active listening and um, maximizing comprehension of text in our classrooms. So there actually have been some studies that have looked at visualization as to support learning and support comprehension. And so I'm just briefly going to share a, um, a study that was done in a middle school science classroom in which different um, teachers decided to use techniques of visualization to support com content learning and comprehension of the text, and certain teachers did not. And um, in that study, they found six learning benefits of visualization. First of all, the drawing definitely increased students' engagement in the learning process. The drawing was definitely seen as a, a mode of interest and uh, had high cachet among the students. Also, the drawing allowed for differentiation of different learning styles. And they found that it promoted comprehension by activating and building on prior knowledge. So as I was saying before, it also promoted deeper understanding and reasoning of the content. In fact, they actually linked it to some specific science disciplinary literacies related to reasoning. And the drawing was actually a scaffold for that more complex understanding. So um, it kind of was, they were able to, in the study, they were able to draw on the students. Oh, I draw, draw. Here's a pun there. I didn't mean it to be a pun. So they were actually able to tap into students' strengths with visual um, visualization of drawing to actually have them be stronger in s certain scientific reasoning skills. And then um, also it helped to aid in discipline-specific ways of visual representation, so tapping into some visual literacy specific to science. And then as you pay, probably may have already guessed, it was a um, very strong tool for formative assessment. So in getting a sense of what the students knew about a topic beforehand, such as evaporation, they had students draw pictures of evaporation and what they thought of when they um, heard the word evaporation and how it works. So it was a way to get a sense of what they understood about a topic beforehand, but then also what they understood about the reading afterwards. So here are some of the sources that I referenced in this um, in this lecture. However, I also want to point out that there are um, linked here, and you are you can access this um, lecture on the course D2L site, and all of these links right here would will be live and take you to full versions of these um, readings, which are talking quite a bit about visualization and comprehension, and talking about different ways to use visualization and comprehension. So if you liked the reading we did for today, the Nielsen and Hibbing reading, uh, there are many other um, rich examples of using visualization to support a variety of di different disciplines. Also as well, there are some more videos that discuss using visualization to support learning and, and complex thinking.